Hello and good morning. I would like to offer a warm welcome to everyone who has joined us today for the fourth Partners webinar um, in this e-humanities and e-heritage series under the title Make it Happen, carrying out research and analyzing data. And our guests for today are George Busecker and Carlo Meghini. Before we start, and I hope you can all hear me already and hopefully also see me. Um, a few words how the webinar um, functions and which um, possibilities you have. Um, for the webinar itself, you as participants are muted and you can also not be seen. Um, only the chat is, uh, can be seen during the webinar and you are um, kindly ask and very welcome to use the chat um, which you find at the right side below of your screen um, the chat for everyone um, to use for questions and remarks um, we hope that you have a lot of questions um, during the presentation and they will be taken up by the trainers um, probably after the presentation I will collect them. Um, if you have sound problems, um, please first of all test your technical settings and um, your, uh, the speaker symbol um, on the top uh, has to be um, green so that you can be able to hear something. Um, yeah, that's uh, about the housekeeping. Um, we are always happy to improve the series and I will post a link later um, to a feedback survey. Um, just a few words about Paternos, um, the project of which I am a member and uh, also our trainers for today are members and who has been organizing the whole um, webinar series. Partners itself is an acronym and it stands for Pooling Activities, Resources and Tools for Heritage, E-Research, Networking, Optimization and Synergies. In short, um, Partners is a Horizon 2020 project which aims at the cohesion of heritage-related e-research. It runs already since 2015 and it will run until April 2019. It's a very international project and it has partners, um, 16 partners from nine European countries and it is coordinated from Italy for, uh, by um, PIN. Last but not least, the Paternos webinar series um, is a cross partners training effort so people from many work packages um, are involved uh, in creating um, and conducting uh, the series or acting as trainers. So these were a few words um, about partners. Uh, my name is Ulrike Wutke. I'm at the moment uh, at um, F, uh, University of Applied Sciences at Potsdam. And now um, we would like to get to know you just a little bit. It's very difficult with so many people um, just uh, um, participating. But uh, you can or I would like to ask you where you come from. Um, and I would also like you to put that um, in the chat so you can already try out uh, the general chat um, which is at, at your right uh, side um, of the screen. So I'm very curious uh, which um, areas uh, of the world are participating today. Maybe some of you um, have risen very early to participate or it's uh, very late. Um, uh, 
Um, I see Vienna and Munich, so, so Germany, Athens. Ah, that's the uh, same country one of our trainers comes from, Copenhagen. Perm, wow, that's really far. Uh, the Hague, Paris, Berlin, Dortmund. Oh, that's really diverse. Pipi pipi. Oh. <laughs> It's a very special place. I think the furthest is, uh, let me go back, um, Nadeshta, um, who is participating from Perm. Wow, okay, cool. Um, thank you very much. So you also have found now um, the chat and I uh, encourage you to use it uh, during the presentation to put um, the questions to our experts there. Um, our experts for today um, are George Brusecker and Carlo Meghini, and uh, maybe they can already um, start sharing their camera and uh, putting on uh, their sounds, uh, starting getting prepared uh, for the presentation. But before they start, um, I would like to introduce them to you. Um, George uh, Brusecker. Um, is uh, from Porth in Greece and he has uh, studied uh, philosophy and he is uh, uh, working in the cultural heritage sector as an information specialist um, already for over 10 years. Um, he has uh, many merits of, I cannot say all of them, but currently um, he is working on the partners project at IHCS Force and he develops and supports the semantic model and the overall architecture uh, for the data integration um, of partners. And he is also a standing member of the CIDOC CRM um, SIG, um, helping to maintaining the ISO standard. Um, his research interests are conceptual modeling, data integration and knowledge provenance. So you see um, he's a um, real expert uh, exactly for today's topic and he's also a member of our package uh, five of Paternos. Um, Carlo Beghini, who is uh, still frozen, but hopefully um, also um, will be able to wave at you at a, in a second, is a leader of Work Package 6 of Partners, and he is a primary researcher at the Institute of Information Science and Technologies of the Italian National Research Council, CNR. Thank you, Rita. Um, um, his area of I, research begin, uh, is digital narratives. I'll begin talking on behalf of uh, and Carlo and I, and thank you to everybody who's uh, the taking the time to join us today for this and, webinar. Um, in his, uh, and thank you, Erika, for uh, past making he it, has uh, already been uh, so um, involved. Our presentation in, today is entitled Make It Happen uh, Carrying Out Piano, Research and is... Analyzing Data in a Research Infrastructure. And as uh, Erika mentioned, Carlo and I are respectively uh, uh, responsible for. Work packages five and six in the Parthenos project, which are responsible for uh, building up the technical infrastructure, both from a design and implementation perspective, to support uh, a cross research infrastructure, uh, research infrastructure platform. Uh, so, um, in order to address this topic in a which is a very big topic in a relatively limited amount of time, uh, we decided to uh, break up our presentation into three parts. Uh, and those three parts uh, begin with uh, looking uh, at the less technical issue, but the reason why we want to do research in a research, research infrastructure anyhow. Um, so looking at the benefits that we're looking for of doing research within an RI, and then the challenges that come with making that decision. Uh, then in the second section, we want to uh, focus in on those challenges from the technical perspective and say, what are the technical difficulties uh, to setting up an effective RI? And then uh, look more specifically at the proposition that we've had within uh, the Parthenos project to try and meet those challenges. Uh, and then uh, because uh, it's nice to think about how this goes into uh, everyday practice. Um, the last section, we'd like to try to get a little bit more down to earth by step in the big picture. Uh, what are the uh, 
various moments of a workflow of a new workflow that would be doing research within an RI. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Carlo in a moment to begin the first section. Uh, but I just wanted to say that um, building an RI and participating in RI, making an RI successful and getting the benefits out, out of a research infrastructure uh, can sometimes seem like uh, the uh, I studied philosophy, uh, the ancient uh, paradox of Zeno, uh, which describes uh, the impossibility of Achilles or a hare uh, catching up with a tortoise uh, that's moving slightly slower ahead of him, uh, because in order to reach the tortoise, he'd have to get half the way to the tortoise and then half the way of the distance that remained. And so it would seem infinitely far away. So it can be uh, sometimes a frustrating for, uh, uh, task. On the other hand, um, there's the Aesopian fable about the tortoise and the hare, which is more of a moralistic story instead of a metaphysical story. Uh, the attitude that we should have in order to achieve a goal. Uh, and uh, I think within uh, doing research in a research infrastructure, or trying to make one happen and be successful, we have to have the attitude of the tortoise, which is slow but steady wins the race, rather than uh, being the hare that wants to get results uh, tomorrow. So with that, I hand over to Carlo. George and uh, good morning to everybody and uh, also from myself thank you for being here so let's start uh, the uh, webinar uh, uh, more technical part by talking about the benefits and the challenges of research infrastructure for the researcher from from your point of view that would be my first take is uh, what is a research infrastructure well, uh, the, there is an implicit E, in, uh, which is normally missed those days in the uh, research infrastructure name, which means electronic research infrastructure or digital, if you prefer. So by research infrastructure, we mean a complex system made up of information and communication technology which is a set up and it's constantly enriched, maintained and updated by a very large research organization uh, as we go along uh, we will see how complex and costly it is to maintain a research infrastructure so the research organization that makes an investment to set it up and run it it's normally a large research organization which serves uh, the needs of uh, a, a large research community that is homogeneous from the point of view of the field uh, they work on. So we have research infrastructure, for instance, in linguistics, this is called CLARIN, but we also have research infrastructure in the hard science, for instance, we work with the vulcanology uh, research infrastructures, and there are many, many, many more. So there is a scientific community who conducts research and uses the research infrastructure for uh, their everyday activity. The same way they have laboratories and tools, microscopes and computers within laboratories, and they have uh, rooms and uh, offices within uh, the physical world, then the research infrastructure is somehow the digital projection of uh, the uh, research organization that makes available digital tools uh, to carry out uh, research to uh, the real community. So we can think of a research infrastructure as being uh, uh, the digital extension of uh, uh, the research organization that supports it and maintains it and invests on it. Uh, normally we call uh, uh, the assets that are made available through the research infrastructure, we call them resources. And uh, these resources that researchers use to do research every day um, encompass many things. First of all, they encompass data and uh, knowledge about those data, such as metadata that are added to the data for the purpose of uh, making them usable, understandable, and findable, and so on. So data would be data sets, uh, would be uh, corpora for the linguistic people, 
and knowledge would be everything that is added to those data as metadata or um, um, knowledge to, to make the data uh, easy to use. Scientific literature is, of course, part of uh, the data that is available to researchers. In addition to data, we have uh, on a research infrastructure tools for processing data. So, for instance, one such tool could be a visualizer for a certain kind of image or a program to extract the statistical uh, um, um, means from uh, uh, a data set and also those tools they come equipped with their metadata with their knowledge that makes them usable available and discoverable and accessible finally as a, a, in a research infrastructure we find services so typically a research infrastructure is accessible through a portal and in this portal users can authenticate can get authorization to do uh, to use services and tools and data on the research infrastructure they are uh, managed by the research infrastructure as a community for instance the research infrastructure may provide communication facilities mailing lists uh, and uh, social uh, network like uh, messaging systems and so on Another service uh, we will be talking about in later is resource discovery and access, where the resources are what I just mentioned. And then the most advanced form of service, which is virtual research environments, which are dedicated environments where researchers find all they need to do a specific kind of research. So research infrastructure is all these. And I suppose you, you, you are researchers and uh, you find uh, those things useful for your everyday activity. So here is the first question to you. Uh, are you happy with the data tools and services that you currently have access to? So we have asked this question to just drive your attention towards the main topic of the seminar. And you can uh, uh, say uh, answer yes or uh, you would yes you could be positive you say but i would like uh, to have more i would like things to be easily more easily discoverable and usable or accessible um, i would like to have more tools or you may be entirely unhappy so i will wait why you um, answer uh, the questions and then uh, we will move on uh, with, with the rest of the talk. So I can see that uh, uh, most of the people would like to have more tools for processing. Yes, I think this is uh, quite understandable. Okay, so uh, Top choice was, uh, yes, I would like to have uh, more tool. This sounds reasonable. The very reason for setting up a research infrastructure is to provide tools to researchers. Um, discovery is, uh, was uh, uh, voted very much as well. Yes, how to make them discoverable. Uh, tools and services is going to be one of the most important topics that we will address in this talk. And then, of course, accessibility and uh, and uh, um, accessibility and uh, usability and more more resources are also have been voted. Okay, so you're all well well aware in a sense of uh, what benefit you would have from having a research infrastructure available to you. So you would be able to share your data find them and uh, um, use them, but also on the other uh, side to make them available. And here you find linked data on, on the slide because of course the, the issue when uh, using other people's data or giving your data to other people in order to make them usable is of course making them easy to use and easy to understand, find common formats, find common um, types. Uh, and so this is uh, would be um, sharing the data would be 
uh, an important benefit. But also sharing tools. Uh, we all know that uh, within the same community there exists uh, normally a large variety of tools. Some tools are better uh, for certain tasks, but how do you know which tools are there and how do you know what are more trustable and so on. The research infrastructure is expected to make tools available and also to provide you with the right information on how to access them and how to use them and what is best for, uh, for other tools. And then in, additional, in addition to that, uh, we have the services. We would like to share service and I have already mentioned several typologies of service, services for communication, service for collaboration, service for writing together a research proposals, serving for doing an experiment uh, 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 together, and the top service of all, which is a virtual research environment. So these, uh, and from your answer, I can see that uh, uh, you are well aware of how important it is to share service. And of course, uh, it is important that uh, uh, researchers are able to assess the uh, trustworthy of what they share. So you need to have something that is easy to discover and efficient to use, but most important is how trustable is what you find on a research infrastructure. How trustable are the data? How trustable is the tool? And in order to allow researcher to appreciate uh, the trustable, the, the trustability, the trustworthiness of uh, tools and data, we add knowledge to them that would uh, help researchers understand and assess the usability of what they find. And uh, but in order to have uh, these benefits, of course, there are barriers that need to be uh, overcome. And uh, here we have uh, uh, an example of uh, most important variable uh, barriers. First of all, resources need to be uh, made visible. We, uh, the resources in a research infrastructure are resources that uh, are part of the research organization that creates the research infrastructure. How are they made visible and discoverable to the researchers that use the research infrastructure? This is the first problem. And uh, also in the poll, this came out as one major problem. And we will see what kind of strategies are in place for this. Standards. If the community is large enough, it will include researchers who have been trained on different methodologies to do uh, research on different ways of describing their assets, on different types of data to use, on different type of tools. If we need, uh, if we want to share those data and those tools, we need to rely on standards so that my data and my tools will be usable and understandable to you from the same community, but perhaps from a different culture. And the cultural problem is definitely the, the core of the problem. So we need to agree on uh, sharing uh, a set of methodologies and procedures and tools on the research infrastructure to make it useful to everybody. So it requires a big effort to, to build a research infrastructure. It's a huge investment that goes through a number of steps, each one uh, having its own difficulty. So, uh, shared general priorities. We need to agree on a mission that the research infrastructure is going to fulfill, and this mission has to be shared by all the members of the community. And then we need to, point two, to set up a, a common context. So, which are the data we are going to share, what are the formats, what are the ways of describing data and tools, and what are the means to make them discoverable, and so on. Then we need to do, to do things. Of course, it's not possible to expect that everybody uses the same workflow to do the same thing. The research infrastructure should make available different workflows uh, for different uh, researchers to do different things. But there, there must be an agreement. Thousands of researchers 
uh, need to settle for a dozens of workflows. So there are two order of magnitudes that needs to be covered uh, by sharing and uh, making common. And then, of course, uh, uh, deploying the data and the tool in the research infrastructure is important, and it is important to uh, be able to deploy them in the rich research environments that the research infrastructure will make available for its researchers. We will touch upon each one of these points later on, so I need not to uh, stay much on this. This is just a, um, a menu for what's to come. And now on to George for the technical challenges to set up uh, a research infrastructure. Um, so in this section, I want to go briefly uh, through uh, how these uh, challenges of uh, setting up a, a research infrastructure uh, translate into technical problems uh, and the solution that we've proposed in Parthenos. Before I do that, uh, I wanted to throw the ball back to you uh, and ask what percentage of your time do you devote to downloading, installing, configuring, and maintaining IT tools, or maybe trying to understand and clean existing data for your research? Uh, and we have poll answers of less than 25%, 25 to 50, and more than 50%. I'll give you a moment to think about that and give some answers. Uh, this is uh, pretty interesting. Uh, I think that we see, uh, I think that we see from these results that uh, it's obviously a, a huge investment of time. Whether it's uh, uh, it's it's not a insignificant, insignificant amount of people who've responded uh, that say twenty five to fifty, and uh, some people even say more than fifty. So we didn't differentiate on tools versus data sets, but it's obvious that. Uh, any way that we can add efficiency into that process uh, would make people's uh, research lives uh, better uh, because you could spend more time uh, thinking about your answers rather than doing uh, fiddling about with uh, cleaning data or setting up tools. So I think we can close the poll. Thank you for voting. So, uh, When we think about setting up, uh, when we've come to the point uh, where a community says we want to do research within the context of a, an RI, um, we've agreed these shared priorities, uh, then uh, a technical challenge comes up because uh, what's needed then uh, to build this uh, uh, E uh, context uh, is to have a common representation of the data uh, and the uh, information that's interesting uh, to this community. Um, so, in terms of an information, uh, that comes to uh, be described as the information integration challenge. That challenge is that data is inherently heterogeneous. Uh, and what I mean is that uh, once we have the goodwill to set up a community uh, that wants to do research together, we're going to have to bring their data together so they can share that information, share those tools, share those services. and. By its very nature, data is heterogeneous because it's made by human beings who have different uh, financial resources, different time commitments. They study different uh, objects. Uh, this means that they're going to be describing different things. They use different tools. This brings in different standards, different formats, different uh, information. And then, of course, our research questions are, are and our methodologies uh, are entirely different. And so even studying the same objects with the same tools uh, we can come up with different descriptors and different information that's salient and relevant. So we have to bring heterogeneous data together. Two common solutions are uh, to say, let's uh, come up with a minimal standard. It's impossible for us to really understand uh, everything together. So let's pick a few fields that we all agree on and we'll at least match on that. Or there's a maximalist approach, which would be to say, we all work in the same thing. So let's come up with a new standard in which we maximally understand uh, what's going on in our domain 
and create an all-encompassing uh, data standard and then try and uh, reformat our data into this common expression. Both of these are valid solutions. They, uh, depending on your context, uh, they have advantages and they have disadvantages. Um, oops, moving on to the next slide. But uh, we would argue uh, in the Parthenos project uh, that both uh, fall prey to what you could call a supermar supermarket bias. And the supermarket bias uh, is basically that when we come into an RI, uh, we immediately think of, uh, I want to get something. So I want to get a data set, I want to get a tool, or I want to give something, I want to give a data set or a tool. So we think about things. Uh, but a supermarket of information, just creating a catalog uh, that says there's X, Y, and Z, doesn't give enough contextual information to meet the trust goal uh, that Carlo presented earlier. To use data or tools in a scientific manner, we have to have uh, a wider context of information about uh, each uh, object that we want to work with. We need to know where it came from, how it was made, uh, and furthermore, we need to know uh, in terms of these visibility issues and uh, these accessibility issues, who has it, how do they maintain it, how do I get a hold of it, under what conditions, these sorts of things. Um, if there's something wrong, who do I contact? Uh, so what we need is not a list of items, uh, but a picture of a scholarly env environment. So in the Parthenos project, uh, we uh, came up with a different strategy for attempting to uh, build uh, the foundations for a research infrastructure. And so instead of rushing immediately to the end goal of a catalog that will give me the things that I want uh, in precisely the way that I need them, we said you have to take a step back and say, we need to fundamentally focus on uh, showing uh, resources in context. So uh, yes, data sets, yes, software tools, uh, but what services provide those? Who's hosting this data? Do Are there multiple copies of it? Are there duplicate and variant copies? Are they updated or are they not updated? Uh, it's really important uh, to map also the actors involved in data creation or data curation. So uh, who uh, can I contact to learn more about this data or find out how to develop this software further? And in the context of what projects uh, do these things occur? Uh, so uh, to uh, meet that goal, uh, we came up with a conceptual model called the Parthenos Entities uh, and accompanying it, uh, something called the Parthenos Minimal Metadata Standard. And the idea is that, um, when we come into a research infrastructure environment, we want to expose our resources uh, to others, the data sets, the software, the services, um, but uh, we don't want to make the demands that you reformat all your data in one way uh, or that you've specifically documented it in one way or the other. So we create a conceptual model uh, based off a, a higher level ontology called CDOC CRM, which allows you to translate information you currently have about data sets and software and represent it uh, to the community. And on the other hand, uh, we come up with this idea of a minimal metadata standard, which sounds a lot like the minimal metadata I was talking about before. The difference being that we're not saying use these five common fields. We're saying if you express data uh, according to this conceptual model and you want to be able to track in a reliable, trustworthy way uh, a data set or a service, then these are data points uh, that probably you should have if you want to be able to recover from errors or find if something uh, is duplicate, these sorts of questions. So we give the possibility also of uh, having a format for entering uh, your information in the first place uh, in this model. Uh, and then I'm going to pass over to Carlo in a second after I explain this picture of how things would work. Um, so our idea is that you have uh, at base the real world at the bottom of this diagram, which could be bibliographic. Am I, am I frozen? Okay, doesn't matter. Uh, uh, so we have at the base uh, bibliographic information or field research or what have you. And then a second, in the second column, we have uh, institutions, actors, or research infrastructures, it doesn't matter the scale, that use the tools uh, and the data formats that are appropriate to their research. Uh, so we don't intervene at that level. They then decide to work together. They uh, 
represent their information via this conceptual model into a common registry, uh, they can both enter the information for the first time or map their data into this format if they've already described this information. Uh, and then on the basis of that, they'll be able to decide the common tools that they have, the common data sets uh, that would be interesting uh, to uh, create uh, common research together uh, and really tightly integrate data sets that work with certain tools uh, that are appropriate to certain research topics into various uh, different virtual research environments, which will produce new information, which can be registered back into the central register. Uh, now, I will hand back to Carlo for a moment because uh, I have presumed uh, an understanding of virtual research uh, environments, and I'd like Carlo to elucidate on that uh, for a moment. Thank you, George. Uh, a virtual research environment, we said, is one of the basic services offered by a research infrastructure. And what it is, in fact, it is uh, similar to a research infrastructure. It is a complex IT systems uh, that offers data, tools, and uh, um, services. But the important difference uh, with the research infrastructure is that uh, the virtual research environment is uh, focused on a, a specific research theme. So it is set up in order to support a subset of the community to carry out research on a specific research team. So while the research infrastructure will stay for a long time, as long as the community will stay alive, a virtual research environment only lives for the time needed to carry out uh, uh, one specific research and it makes available to the researchers all the specific tools and data that are needed to carry out this specific research. On the other hand, the virtual research environments may be wider in space. It's more limited in time, but it can be wider in space because there can be uh, several research infrastructures who join on the same virtual research environment. So we know that research is typically interdisciplinary. So suppose you want to do some research work and you are a linguist, but you want to interact with some statisticians from another community and, from, and with uh, uh, social scientists, you can set up a virtual research environment that overarches these three communities and makes available uh, the tools to carry out the specific research. So virtual research environments are very advanced tools that are being nowadays developed and the lucky scientists, researchers who have them, find them very useful for, for their purposes. Okay, now back to George. Thanks, Carla. So in the last section of this presentation, uh, we just wanted to get back to make it happen uh, and look at uh, the process uh, that would happen uh, in doing research uh, in a uh, research uh, infrastructure context. Um, and I'll refer back to the pyramid image and say that uh, a lot of the work goes in uh, at the start to build the foundations. Once you build the foundations, uh, then you get the benefit of that investment. So we've broken down this research and register and research again data cycle into five points, which is first register your initial resources as a community. Uh, that's uh, then uh, map existing data uh, to uh, the overall register. Based on that information, you'll have a new tool, which is a registry, which gives a picture of the available resources uh, of your community. And using that registry as your central tool, you can match it to your research questions and begin to decide what uh, information within that community is worthwhile uh, to invest your uh, research and your technical time uh, to do a deeper integration that will match data sets and tools uh, in services in a virtual research environment that will allow you to really carry out new research uh, and take those results and publish them back into the register. So we'll look at those points uh, one by one uh, briefly. So in the picture that we're presenting, your first step is to build the foundation of your uh, research infrastructure, uh, if it's not already done, uh, and that would entail uh, making this uh, picture of the resources available. Um, 
this can this often involves having to manually register information because uh, when you're working individually as a researcher as an institution you create the data you create and you don't register the meta level of the fact that you do those things uh, so the first thing to do is to register into the community the fact of your existence the fact of the services you run the facts of the major data sets that you collect uh, this can be done through tools like as simple as a spreadsheet uh, a relational database or a triple store, depending on uh, your flavor and your technical availability. Uh, particular examples of those could be as simple as a Google spreadsheet, a Drupal instance, or an Orient DB in terms of triple stores. Um, in the bottom right hand corner, I've put these little boxes called resources, uh, and you could look at them uh, after uh, the webinar. Uh, they provide some documents that are relevant to the topic. So. Here, the Parthenos Minimal Metadata Recommendation is a document that talks about things you might want to document about your resources. And uh, the basic Google Spreadsheets is uh, expressing that simply in a spreadsheet as a way to get going on documenting resources. Um, and a very quick example, uh, uh, within Parthenos, one of our partners is the European Holocaust Research Infrastructure. And uh, so, their first step uh, in getting into sharing their data with the, the community uh, was to come in and register. They don't have a database of their own activities. So register their services that they run the uh, ARI portal and then register the data set that that portal gives access to, which is uh, this uh, archive of, well, this aggregation of archival assets that have to do with uh, Holocaust uh, uh, material and remembrance. So the second step then is to say, this is a two part step really, but the, when you first approach mapping, it'll say, uh, I want to share the maximum amount of data with my partners in the research infrastructure. So I've said, I have this data set, that data set talks about data sets. So you can map uh, your data into the register. That's one level of mapping. And then once you have a register, you might need to do data mapping again, because you want to bring together pools of information uh, and so you'll decide we're going to go for this standard for this topic and that standard for that topic. So it's not about transforming once into one thing. It's about building a registry to see what information you have and then transforming on the fly to data standards that you want, recording that and making that reusable by other scholars. Uh, so uh, to do that task, uh, you need a mapping tool. Uh, you need a way to transform uh, data based on, on your mapping from one format to another. You need data cleaning services. Uh, you need standardized vocabularies to be able to harmonize data values within data sets. And you need to follow this whole process and be able to rerun it systematically if you need to make changes for which you need an aggregation manager. Um, so I don't have to, time to get into the technical details of the tools, but I've given links again. So within the Parthenos project, uh, we've adopted uh, a tool set called the X3ML Toolkit for mapping, uh, and that allows you to do declarative mappings between one data structure and another, uh, which means that, uh, and the nice thing about it is it's not programmatic, so you can set it up visually uh, and you can work on it as a scholar uh, and then team up with a, a IT specialist to make the transformation actually happen, and then you can rewrite them very easily and reuse them and share them with other users. We use Themos Vocabulary Manager, which is for handling, uh, managing standardized data. And we use this DNet service for uh, running the aggregations and tracking what happens. You see some resources that I've shared at the bottom. Uh, the Parthenos Entities document describes the uh, general model uh, for building a, a registry that I spoke about. Minimal meta doc metadata document again. And if you're doing uh, semantic data, uh, then you might use CDOC CRM. So I put a link to that as well. And just to illustrate that, uh, we have uh, a data mapping situation here. So on the left, we have the input, uh, and that would be any old uh, data standard. Uh, and then we need a mapping tool. Uh, X3ML is illustrated here. And so you have uh, the input of the one data standard, and then you uh, make a visual mapping to the other standard. Uh, and then I, the end result would be that you are in an aggregation aggregation environment like DNet, uh, where you see the data inspection tool below, uh, where you're able to control moving the data into the new format. Um, and then my last uh, contribution for this section 
is to say that brings us to the point uh, where you can really start doing uh, the interesting work. Uh, so now you have a picture of the common resources available, be they data sets or software services, uh, who is involved in them. Uh, and then this makes your registry the central tool to match to your research questions and say, okay, now given uh, that we have this picture of our, our, our data world, uh, we have linguistic resources that refer to this cultural area. We have archaeological resources that refer, refer to that area. We have these teams that work on that and those teams that work on that. Is it possible to uh, make a harmonization of the data and bring together appropriate tools uh, to make uh, a common project? And on that topic, I would like to hand over to Carlo to talk about uh, setting up virtual research environments. Okay, thank you, George. So once you have everything in place, you basically go to the uh, people in your uh, that run the platform of your research infrastructure, and you are you fill in a form, or you talk to them, or whatever mean they establish, and you ask, uh, "Look, I need the virtual research environments with these tools, with this data to do this kind of job." And then you will have to say what is your community, what are your permissions, uh, and a lot of uh, details that the technical people setting up the VRE for you will want to know. So <clears throat> I do this uh, as uh, everyday activity. So on, I use the D4Science platform, uh, which is uh, covering a number of research infrastructure, actually. Uh, so in this slide, you see once I log in, you, you see what I see in my private workspace. I have uh, seven virtual research environments uh, where I work more or less every day. And if I click on one of those, uh, for instance, I click on Parthenos, uh, a new window will pop up. And in this window, I have access to the virtual research environment. And so, uh, for instance, in Parthenos virtual research environments, I have uh, four different uh, tools, uh, one uh, for uh, uh, talking to the members, uh, an issue tracker, an XTML mapping tool that I use to set up uh, the uh, mappings that George just referred to. And here I have uh, a Facebook-like uh, window to share messages uh, with members of the community. So. This is a visual research environment. So I find tools, I find data, I find services on them. And then once I, have, I am in the visual research environment, I can start using those data to create new data, new knowledge. For instance, if I create mappings, I will add new knowledge for the data conversion and mapping tools. So the VRE is really where is the laboratory of the research infrastructure where new data sets, new knowledge are created and uh, registered, uh, re-entered the, in the cycle of registering the data and so on to, to share the, the, the new knowledge that is being created uh, um, with the rest of the community. So in this phase is very domain dependent, the resources that are being used to, to execute this phase and uh, the data, it's very domain dependent, so, but you can imagine uh, what happens. So new data are being created and then they are registered on the fly uh, uh, to be discoverable and accessible by other people according to the level of permissions, of course, that you grant um, to the data. So at this point, uh, um, I would like to ask you uh, what are the chief benefits that you hope from a research infrastructure? You more or less heard what are the uh, features that the research infrastructure offer. Now uh, we are asking you to figure out uh, what in your daily activity you would like to have a research infrastructure for. And the answer here is open. So there is no choice. You can type in uh, uh, whatever you want to uh, please be brief uh, time is running quickly um, perhaps we leave this uh, for the discussion smart CRM good 
reproducible science, yes, annotate uh, data sets and tools so that other people can re-execute the experiments. Reproducibility is the basic feature of scientific work and the basic concern of uh, uh, a research infrastructure. So you hit uh, the, right, uh, the right targets in this. So perhaps I will now run uh, to the um, to the conclusion of the of the webinar, so that uh, uh, we have some times uh, at least ten minutes for discussion. If uh, Ulrike would close the poll, okay. Thank you. I think if there are other uh, suggestions, we can uh, discuss them uh, during the the question and time answers. So we have tried uh, to cover a quite complex and uh, um, extended topics, which is uh, research infrastructure and which research environments. Uh, what are the priorities? What, how to build uh, the data foundations and the knowledge foundations? Register what you have and what you know. Make it available. Uh, make it findable. Make it accessible by using uh, the tools that the platform gives to you. And uh, from the foundations, we have seen that virtual research environments <clears throat> are used as laboratories where new knowledge is created. And along with the new knowledge, new data and um, uh, new formal knowledge is added to the research infrastructure. And uh, the process of building all this, it's slow. And uh, but like the, the tortoise, uh, it's steady across an infinite distance to reiterate the fact that research infrastructure are now being built. They are part of the knowledge economy that uh, the uh, European Commission has given to its elf, and it's covering the needs of researchers to create an ideal ecosystem. Uh, Europe wants to be the ideal place to carry out research and the digital plays a big role in this as we have seen during this presentation. And this is all I want to say. Now I hand it back to Ulrike to um, lead the question and answer session. Yeah, thank you very much for this very, very interesting um, presentation. Sorry, my voice. Um, I will just bring up uh, the slide uh, for the question and answer session. I don't know how the participants feel, but uh, my head is definitely swimming uh, with all of the technical terms you have been using, but uh, you made uh, some of the concepts clearer to me, um, which is uh, really a challenge. Um, so just to give uh, some time for the people to uh, collect their thoughts and to start typing um, questions they are having, um, I want to use the opportunity to already announce the next and also last partner's webinar, um, which uh, will be uh, conducted uh, by Daria Fischer and me, and it will be about uh, developing research questions. So it will uh, go into details about developing research questions with research infrastructures and it will also um, feature uh, aspects of uh, involving citizen science for example um, into your humanities and e-heritage research. Um, yeah, the links uh, will be shared with you. Um, also, um, there is a nice uh, video on the partners training channel with Kristen Schuster um, explaining ontologies in five minutes or less. And we will have a workshop at the European Summer University by um, partners, which will also include um, the webinars um, and also George and Carlo again live. So I'm looking forward to this, but coming to the question and answer um, back and there, let me just bring up um, the pet, the pot with the question. Um, to, to pick up on the further resources to consult, 
Um, actually, these are uh, very hot topics that are being researched uh, now. So it's uh, not uh, really possible to find uh, monographs or this kind of material where you can find them. You have to be a patient and look for PhD thesis and scientific articles in conferences that talk and try to define um, um, what a research infrastructure is, what a virtual research environment is. And you have also to be ready to confront very different opinions, uh, very fragmented landscape, because uh, uh, different communities, of course, give emphasis to different aspects, uh, and it will take some time before this concept uh, uh, so solidify and become the subject of university courses. So for the time being, just uh, try to uh, Google search, Google Scholar conferences about virtual research environment and research infrastructure, and there you will find research papers. And, uh, and as I said, be ready to confront uh, uh, different definition. Perhaps uh, it is more useful to uh, surface, to surf the web and try to find uh, uh, research infrastructure like Clarin, like Daria, and so on, and, and see for yourself what kind of service they have to offer. T4 Science is a good starting point because it provides a number of virtual research environments to different projects. I counted about uh, 40 different VREs in D4 Science. So this is a good point to start browsing what VREs are and what they do. And I believe they also have some white papers online, some resources that you can consult. But at the moment, there is nothing more solid than this. Can I jump in on a question? Uh, I wanted to uh, jump in on uh, Martina's questions. Um, so the last one was, is there a registry of uh, VREs or RIs? Um, so that uh, is what Parthenos uh, aims to be uh, for uh, its sector. Uh, but because we're uh, currently in the middle of making it, uh, you won't find that. Uh, but if you stay tuned, uh, we are building this uh, registry of RIs in our sector, which we would hope to expand. Uh, so that's, uh, but it, of a, a general uh, registry of RIs, I would say it does, to my knowledge, it does not exist. Um, and I wanted to just point to the um, first question about uh, data taking more, data uh, munging taking more time. Um, it's true, and what I find really uh, fascinating is how, uh, people don't work on making it reproducible. Uh, and uh, it's what's really interesting about the XGML tool set is that uh, you don't do the data transformation and data munging one time uh, and then have it just for yourself, but you uh, create this declarative mapping that you can share into the data pool and say, uh, if you're looking at this data set and you need it that way, um, I've already done that work. Uh, and I think that has a lot of uh, potential applications for data scientists uh, to apply that uh, and instead of uh, doing one-off work, make it uh, generally available so that we don't have, again, we don't focus on one standard, but we say data is in many formats and we include with data uh, intellectually sound and reproducible mappings to other formats that are required for different uh, uses. Okay, I'd like to, to pick up the question on provenance for reproducibility. Uh, basically, <clears throat> the idea is that uh, when you have a resource in the information space of, uh, uh, of a research infrastructure, you have knowledge associated to that resource. So, uh, like in the Parthenos entities model, it's uh, a structure of this knowledge. So, for a data set, you may have knowledge uh, uh, about the content of the data set, what kind of data it contains, uh, measurements and so on, but also how it's been generated, who did it, using what tools, using what platform, when, and, and so on. So this uh, extra information or metadata or knowledge, if you like, uh, is associated and made available 
to the researcher by the research infrastructure using a certain model so that the researcher can see those data and figure out how to reproduce the same result by replicating the same experiments. This implies that uh, the data and the tools are available, but uh, it's basically the first step to support uh, reproducibility. And of course, as we proceed in time, we can make this information consumable also to machines. We can formalize so that we can write uh, uh, another program that reproduces the results of a certain program by massaging and using this provenance information in the appropriate way. So basically the same way you have uh, uh, catalographic descriptions of books in a library uh, or uh, metadata in uh, about files and programs on your computer, in a research infrastructure you, you should find the provenance information about the resources that are shared and made accessible through the research infrastructure. And this provenance information is partly manually entered by researchers, but it's also partly automatically generated by the infrastructure itself uh, while uh, it processes the data. So I took too much time. I hope the answer is fine. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, I think those, uh, this was a very interesting discussion and um, I hope uh, that uh, the answers um, also met uh, the expectations, I mean met the expectations, but uh, I, these are such complex topics, it's uh, very difficult um, to discuss them in uh, such a short time. Um, but uh, I think we managed, uh, you managed very well, George and Carlo. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, the time is running out. Um, we already uh, spent uh, the hour dedicated uh, to the webinar and um, I don't want to keep the participants longer and also not take your time longer, but I uh, want to take the chance to thank you, first of all, the participants for being with us. I hope um, you um, found uh, this webinar very useful and very informative. We will share the materials with you afterwards, so the recording and the slides, and I will put um, up all this stuff um, on the Partners Training Suite. I write a short wrap up with the trainers um, and link with the available materials. I would be very grateful if you take a moment um, to uh, fill in the feedback survey to help us improving um, the webinar. So give a bit feedback on uh, um, how you experience the webinar. And last but not least, um, thank you. And I hope to see you back the next time. But the last words, as always, are to our trainers, to Carlo and George, um, who joined us from Italy and Greece. Enjoy Orthodox Easter if you're doing that sort of thing. Thank you. Good recover from Catholic Easter if you have done that. <laughs> okay, then let's all recover and hope to see you back. And I will um, close the webinar room now so the participants will be thrown out when I close the, uh, the room. <laughs>